you would see that I am repeatedly stressing on Krishna as the demolisher, on Krishna as someone who not only not accepts our prevalent definitions of right, wrong, true and false. Humility, authority, right action, non violence. But in fact, unabashedly and actively demolishes them. It is one thing to come up with a revised version of the same old stuff and it is totally another thing to come up with something that is totally fresh, original and unprecedented. That's what Krishna does. When vision deviates from the established definition and concept of something, it is not a minor deviation. It is not an incremental change. It is not a little bit of correction. It is a total explosion. We cannot even say that it is a 180 degree turn. We cannot even say that Krishna speaks the opposite of what we have usually heard. Because even if we say that Krishna stands totally against our concepts, we are still somehow relating Krishna to our own stand. We are still saying that Krishna is giving us another concept which is opposed to our concept and thereby related to our concept. So it's neither a minor deviation nor a major deviation and not even a total deviation. It is a dimensionally different space into which Krishna takes us. I repeat, it's a dimensionally different space into which Krishna takes us. So, yesterday and day before, we have looked at a few yoga verses. The clarity on yoga that Krishna is bringing to us cannot be had unless one is prepared to totally give up that definition which had been resting and established in our mind. We do not give that up, we won't be able to go to the space to the dimension Krishna is calling us to. Demolition is the word, not deviation. Demolition, not deviation. Dissolution not development, right? We'll enter the next verse.
with the care that we do not look at it as coming from our own established knowledge if we do that then krishn yog gita all will elude us he who recognizes inaction in action and action in action is wise amongst men he is a yogi and a true performer of all actions chapter 4 verse 18 he who recognizes inaction in action and action in inaction is wise among men he is a yogi and a true performer of all actions krishna is taking us to the very essence of yoga he who sees in action in action and action in inaction is a yogi a wise man and a true performer of all actions he who sees action in inaction and inaction in action is wise a yogi and a true performer of all actions what does krishna mean here what does action mean to us when you say action what does it mean to you intentional yes and like intentional this means that you're looking for some sort of result from it mhm something that has been meaning and it's meaningful <laughs> 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 I like the way you related action to intention our action is always intentional and physical as you said and begins and ends its assumed end is supposed to come when the intention has been fulfilled when the action achieves its result then it's supposed to come to an end result intention end now how do any of these really relate to action how do any of these really relate to action you see you lift your hand action has taken place this simply is action you lift your hand and that is action, action. yeah hmm? you let this fall and action has taken place so some sort of change 
when you lift your hand or when something falls from a position where is the question of intention in the mind of the doer so for us action is not merely a physical happening it is much more psychological it's a psychological event in which an end must be fulfilled something must be gained some purpose some result <clears throat> must be achieved in other words the position of the actor must change action must result in improvement or betterment or fulfillment of the actor the doer are you getting it so something appears to move in the physical space and along with that something else must also move in the so called internal space as the legs climb a mountain not only must the legs go up not only must the body be taken up the mountain something within must also rise something within must also improve its position something within must be now able to claim that it is better at the top of the mountain compared to when it was at the bottom of the mountain not only has the body been hauled up self worth too has been hauled up something internally too has gone up a few notches action has taken place at two levels at one level there is the world at the other level there is the seer of the world the subject the individual ego do or action pertains to the outside yet it is essentially meant to cater to the welfare of the inside if you really know for example that a particular action is not going to result in an improvement of the i worth would you indulge in it what determines the intensity with which one engages in any action what determines one's interest and energy in any particular action the promise of the quantum of self improvement the increase of self worth that would result from that action if something does not promise anything at all if an action 
does not hold the hope of internal improvement one feels very indifferent to that action one asks why must i act one says what do i get out of it and remember it is not the result of physical action that one is seeking one is seeking something else let's say you climb up a mountain and on top of the mountain there is a flower that you meet and a small restaurant where you can sip some hot coffee these are the tangible perceptible results of external action i climbed up the mountain what did i get the flower and the coffee but is it the flower and the coffee that one acts for it may appear that physical action is resulting in the attainment of something physical so the equation is neat you work physically and you get something physical but don't be deceived by this neatness it is not so neat what you are obtaining from physical action is something non physical that is the real pull that is the bait you work the entire month at the end of the month you get a salary check the input output equation appears to be balanced 30 days you put in your work and 30th day you get the fruit of your work in the form of a salary check but is it so neat it is what that salary check means to you that matters what kind of value does that hold internally one wants to rise one wants to feel a little better improved more complete more fulfilled the salary check by itself does not mean much it is that which the salary check causes within that has meaning i get it you get it so there is action and action there is movement and movement movement where outside and movement inside as well every successive check adds something to the eye sense every incremental figure helps inflate something within when you get a little more in terms of money it is not only a little more money that you are getting a little more something else is also becoming available what is that something else we i said we work the entire month and then one earns a check is it only money that you have earned and when you earn a little more money is it only a little more money or does it change something within something psychologically does not one's own self concept change depending on how much one earns ego is growing ego is growing not only is the bank balance growing along with the bank balance the ego is also growing but the satisfaction you get satisfaction 
who is this one who is getting satisfaction psychological hmm? that psychological entity is called the ego hmm? that which you call as the growth of satisfaction is the growth of this psychological self the evidence that it is merely psychological is that it feeds upon the external it has nothing of its own it measures its self worth depending on external conditions the ratification and the acceptance of others that is why people who do not get their checks for many consecutive months or years start feeling low about themselves the reason why they feel low about themselves is not merely that now they do not have enough money to buy their grocery the reason is the world looks down upon them and because this ego sense has very little of its own it very quickly absorbs the opinions of the world i get it so it's a strange thing one acts in order to change himself one acts so that just as the action takes place outside some action also takes place inside one is improving the state of his house now ostensibly it is a house of brick and mortar that one is seeking to improve but it is not only the house that one is seeking to improve through the house one is seeking to improve through the house one is seeking to improve himself and if it were established known that the improvement in the house will not bring about an improvement in the self then there would not be much energy left to invest in the house one would say why am i working so much why am i investing in this house even after all my efforts i am going to remain the same the house would shine i would not shine so what is the point in having the house shine if that shine is not going to reflect upon me one does not buy a new car one buys a little more self worth one does not merely enter a new relationship with a man or woman one enters a little more polished and beautified ego who am i the one related to that nice man or woman who am i the one related to that nice man or woman now some of the niceness of that man is going to rub off upon me i would shine by way of association that is the way of the psychological self it does not have any roots within so it seeks improvement only through its association with the world hence it constantly tries to do something in the world that would give it something may i have better grades in college may i have a better reputation may i prove something to myself may i prove something to others if we are not careful we would be deceived into thinking that these actions have something to do with the world no they don't have anything to do with the world the world is just being used as a medium the world is just being used as an instrument external achievement is being used as a tool to achieve something internal
the funny thing is that which one is seeking to achieve internally hardly ever gets achieved because the starting point itself says i am inadequate so i need improvement hence improvement has come because you are inadequate the effect can never change the cause you start from some point now wherever you reach that point cannot change the point you started from the foundations of a building cannot be changed by the third floor or can they be when the foundation itself says i am inadequate then based on that foundation whatever you do is not going to make you inadequate one perennially remains with that internal sense feeling of inadequacy incompleteness one constantly feels there is a little more left to achieve well you know i need to be a little better <coughs> you know something needs to change about me so there is action outside which is just a method a tool not of really much value the ego is rather attaching value to its own advancement its own inflation krishna is saying one must see action in an action and inaction in action is it possible to live in a way where what you do outside is purely a thing of the outside where you are not acting so that the action may improve your self worth is it possible is it possible that there is inaction inside and yet a lot of action suitable action even vigorous action outside is it possible to live that way krishna is inviting us even challenging us and krishna is saying can you also see that there is a lot of action contained in your inaction when we began you said that the definition of action for us is mostly physical so if there is no physical action we say action has not taken place at all right krishna is saying now come on don't be duped so easily even if not the slightest movement has taken place still action takes place because action is far more subtle gross action is seen physically subtle action is called thought even when the eyes cannot catch action happening if the mind is moving action is happening action has happened it is just that the ways of the world are such that they will not classify the movement of mind as action you hit someone you will be caught and punished you think of hitting someone nobody is going to catch you but that is not how the seers look at it they say that the action has been committed just with the thought now even if nobody is able to detect it now even if you are not put to task still something has happened how is it proven that something has happened it is proven because you will now be hearing <coughs> the result the 
thought has come to you, so something within you has changed. The result would come upon you. So even if nobody else is there to inflict a result upon you, you have yourself inflicted a result upon yourself. Your thought might not be seen by anybody else, but you know that you have thought. Because you have thought, so now you will have the consequences of the thought. Krishna says, please see that even your inaction includes a lot of action. In fact, often, external inaction is because there is too much action inside. <coughs> the mind is so active and so very contradictorily active that all its energy gets neutralized. One part of the mind fights against another part and there is nothing left to show up on the outside. If someone does not really have eyes, he would look at you and say that you are sitting still. But inside, you know very well that there is a battle raging. It's a world war. And because the world war is all consuming and very severe, so you have been paralyzed. You have been left with no direction to go. You have been left with no sense to advance. There is no single center within from where to move. Krishna is saying, you must know that even when most of us do not act, they are always acting because the actor is on. This actor surely must be a very confused actor. This actor surely must be a very divided actor. Had he really been clear about what he wants, he wouldn't have wasted so much of himself. He wouldn't have indulged in self-defeating fights. What does it mean to act in a way where nothing changes internally, nothing <clears throat> is sought to be changed internally, nothing is sought at all and yet action happens. How is it possible to display action while remaining totally inactive? And Krishna is saying, if you know that, you are a yogi. If you know that, that is yoga. Intentionless action. What would that look like? What would that feel like? When, when you are not acting as a person, I mean like there is no action as a person. What does that mean, to not to act as a person? You see, if you will not act like a person, then you will act like someone else. You would still be there to act. The thing with not doing something is that you are still the doer. The thing with remaining a non-doer is that you still remain. You're still trying to do. Mm -hmm. And that is as much of action as qualified action. I am a non-doer. But you still are. The I am still remains. <coughs> 
Remain silent. Ah, but you still remain. You were talkative earlier. Now you are silent. Just because something has been put on the silent mode doesn't mean that it has lost its fundamental characteristics, its basic tendencies. In fact, now it is hiding. Now it has become more dangerous. The same thing is now wearing a different color and a different name. The face has changed. The man is the same. More dangerous because more holy. Now the mischief is spiritually sanctioned. Now you can claim for yourself that which you do not really have, that which you are really not. So letting action happen is not at all about you remaining as a person or you not remaining as a person. The more you will talk about the I, the more relevant the I will keep becoming. That is something that is often missed. And that is something that requires a teacher of the status of Krishna to clarify. Even if you refer to the I, to negate the I, you have still empowered the I. The more you talk about the I, whether in inquiry or in negation or in exploration, you are still confirming that there exists something called the I. Even when you say I does not exist, what is the center of your statement? The eye smiles nicely from behind. He says, well done. Yes, I do not exist. <laughs> I raises its hand and says, I do not exist. Ten times you asked, who am I? And ultimately you said, well, you know what? The eye does not exist. I said, of course, I do not exist. The more you talk about something, the more that something gets deeply embedded in the psychological space. The only way to forget is forget. You cannot forget by remembering again and again. You cannot forget by remembering the opposite of what you want to forget. But that is something that we all try. You want to get rid of the I, so you start remembering that the I does not exist. Nice. To forget, one just forgets. Or does one say that I have forgotten that I am hurt? When you forget your hurt, does anybody remain to say that I have forgotten my hurt? You even forget that you must mention that you have forgotten. That is the meaning of really dropping. That is the meaning of really coming out of it. You do not remain to talk about it. And that is also the meaning of action in inaction. That is also the meaning of not having anything within that is related to action outside. You do not say that I am acting as a non-person. You do not say that I am acting as the pure self. You don't talk about the action. You don't even let the action happen because action is anyway happening whether or not you let it to. You become absorbed in your own world, in your own space. The body does what it must, the mind does what it must, the intellect does what it must. 
and everybody is nicely settled doing what they must and what their fundamental nature is the i is so absorbed in its own rightful space that it does not even bother to claim that i am not the doer there is a birthday party in your neighborhood hmm do you great gate crash into the party go to the center and declare there i am not the birthday boy there is a birthday party in your neighborhood neighborhood now do you gate crash make your way through the crowd go up to the birthday cake and loudly declare i am not the birthday boy what do you do if you are really not the birthday boy you stay away you simply mind your own business because you have 10 things of your own to do right you don't declare there i am not this i am not that i am negating this i am negating that hmm when you are really free of something you are free even of the obligation to announce your freedom hmm? if you have to constantly assert your freedom it means you are still bonded when you are really free then you don't even consciously know that you are free if consciously you have to repeatedly tell yourself that you are free then the chains still remain so what has to be done gets done and the i sense does not really come into the picture it does not even come to assert that this action is not going to affect me the i sense remains healthy total all right within itself and these are then two spaces disjoint by way of cause and effect how are they joint we will look into that later but what joins them is no more cause and effect usually some cause outside leads to an effect inside does that happen or not what is the cause somebody praised me what is the effect somebody outside praised me what is the effect inside inside me i get a little depends on who the person is sometimes depending on the person if you get praised you may even go down but something happens the cause there has an effect inside now these are two separate spaces whatever happens outside shows no effect inside we will see later whether there is any relation then between this so called inside the center and the so called outside but one thing established in nice neat pure action the effect the relation is not of cause and effect whatever be the cause outside it cannot show up as an effect inside it sounds nice because now nobody who condemns you from there can make you feel bad about yourself but that also means that now nobody who praises you from there can make you feel good about yourself one becomes free both ways you are now no more a slave of the world nothing outside can now make or break you nothing outside now can add value to you or devalue you 
So things keep happening. Movements keep happening where they must happen. But they do not happen where they must not. Success happens, failure happens, but nothing inside succeeds or fails. This is a totally different way of living. Neither is now one running after success and failure, nor is one abhorring success and failure. One is only putting success and failure in their rightful place. Success, you belong there. Failure, you too belong there. Success there is not success here. And failure there is not failure here. That does not mean that I am not acknowledging that something has succeeded or something has failed. Something has surely succeeded. One worked and the results have been of a certain quality. So one can determine whether there has been success with respect to intention of the work or not. I work and the results have again been of a certain other quality. So one can again determine whether or not there has been failure with respect to the intention. But whether there is success or failure, there is no success, no failure here. The cause effect link has been broken. Action outside, inaction inside. And when there is action outside and inaction inside, then one becomes capable of great action. Because now the actor is not at the mercy of results. Because now the actor is free to be in his own space and has also left all the physical apparatus to act in its own way. There is freedom both ways. The intellect can now, without hesitation, without bondage, play its own game. The I will not come to lord over the intellect. The I will not tell the intellect, you know what, if you go beyond this point, then the world will say that I am a bad man. So don't think in those areas. They are not sanctioned. They are immoral. The intellect can now freely pan out. One thinks freely. That is what is called as free thought. Thought that is free from the tyranny of I. Thought that does not serve to boost the ego. Thought at the center of which does not lie your personal welfare. That is free thought. I get it. So, not only are you the I sense free, even the intellect has been left free, even the body has been left free. The body can now do what it must, and the body has great intelligence of its own. Now, the intellect knows how to draw from the memory, and the memory is also not inhibited. Usually, our memory is highly inhibited because the I decides what to highlight in the memory and what to suppress in the memory. Of course, you know that we do not remember everything equally. Some parts in the memory are always magnified and some parts are always suppressed. We do not want to remember a few things. And we want to place excessive weightage upon a few other things, depending on what suits the I sense. Whatever is ordinary about you gets quickly forgotten. Whatever is special and extraordinary gets registered very deeply. Great pleasure 
great registry great pain great registry ordinary movements no registry hmm now that kind of a thing won't happen the memory is free to operate impartially the memory is now free to operate without the eye burden the eyes are also free now the eyes by themselves now know where to look our eyes are not free the eye dictates where the eye would look at as you walk through a market do you look at everything equally of course not nobody can do that nor is that something that must be done but you must observe the process of determining the object of sight you look at that which feeds the eye sense so the eyes are now handicapped chained the ears do not hear everything do our ears hear everything no they don't they only hear what the eye loves to hear that which the eye does not want to hear the ears are compelled to ignore that we do not listen through our ears we listen through our ego the ears are needlessly often blamed you say i didn't listen actually that's a terrific statement and absolutely true when you say i didn't listen it is actually the i that didn't listen it is not as if the ears didn't hear the ears heard but the i didn't listen the ears too are unnecessarily suffering because that thing within interferes with all that is we do not know what the world is like because the eyes have not been permitted to look directly without prejudice at the world mind stuff knowledge the mind has not been left free to really have natural and free flowing mind stuff one has knowledge only in the direction and only in the space that benefits the ego don't you see that our knowledge is all purposeful do you ever feel eager to have purposeless knowledge rare are those moments otherwise if you are a doctor you want more knowledge in medicine why because that would make you a better doctor so ever even the knowledge is compulsorily pushed into the mind by the ego sense the ego sense decides what must you know and what you know becomes your consciousness you start floating in that reality what else is consciousness nothing but the sky of all your knowledge knowledge tendencies intentions that is consciousness Hmm? our consciousness therefore is not at all a free consciousness our consciousness is a consciousness that is dictated and lorded over by this petty suffering i sense the i sense dictates what our entire system would be like it dictates what our eyes would be like our face would be like our body would be like our consciousness would be like our life would be like to dissociate these two your internal sense of well being from external happenings is to live healthily in all ways always internal external total In fact when you are living in a healthy way then the distinction between the internal and the external gets 
delete it. Health is total. I get it. Now we have someone whose actions rise and fall. That one doesn't rise and fall. Now we have actions where the actions succeed and fail. The actor doesn't succeed or fail. Now we have a situation where the eye looks and does not look because the eye cannot look at everything. The eye must focus. Now we have a situation where the eye looks or does not look. You neither look nor do you not look. You leave it to the eye. Go ahead. Coordinate with the intellect. Don't come to me. The intellect will tell you what to look at. So the eye is looking. You are neither looking nor not looking. You have left the eye, the mind, the intellect to decide on these matters. You have become very, very powerful by your absence. You are not there anymore to counsel anyone, guide anyone or have authority over anyone. You are relaxing, you are settled, you are total and free in your own space. The eyes witness a murder that does not really do anything to you. Well, it does something to the mind. It may also do something to the emotions, but it does nothing to you. And the eyes look at a most beautiful sight. That too does nothing to you. Well, that does do something to the poet inside you. That does do something to your hands. They pick up the camera and start clicking. That does do something to your face. It moves into a smile. So the sight of a beautiful mountain or waterfall does something to all those who are the rightful recipients of action. You remain a non-recipient of all action. Eyes look at mountains. The hands rise in exclamation. Eyes look at the mountain. The legs run about in excitement. Eyes look at the mountain. The mouth calls to your friend. Come over. What a beautiful sight. Eyes look at the mountain. The memory may move to relate that to something else that you have seen or read elsewhere. But even as all this game is being played out, you remain what you are. And what is that? Well, nothing. So you do not remain. You are wonderfully healthy in your absence. You are not there. The eyes are there, the legs are there, the mouth is there, the voice is there, the sight is there, the entire world is there. You are not there. You have nothing to do with this drama. Then this show proceeds very, very smoothly. Then the actors are not unnecessarily pressurized. Hmm? You know of those taskmaster directors? When the show is going on, they stand just behind the curtains where the audience cannot look at them but the actors know their presence and from there they keep asserting their presence. Hmm? What do they do to the actors? They traumatize them. In their own minds probably they are trying to help but because of their unrequired, useless unsolicited presence, they are only unnecessarily spoiling everything. In fact, if they go away, then the actors would be more free to act, to dance, to express themselves. And that's a beautiful word we have come upon, expression. When you are not there 
to burden your entire system and the world with the expectations of I, then you express yourself. And that is one of the reasons, rather the most important reason, why our life remains unexpressed. We live mostly unfulfilled, unsaid, undone, unlived, <coughs> unexpressed lives. Like a kid who won't play because he is afraid that he would be laughed at. Like a little girl who won't speak up in her school because she is afraid that she would be mocked at. That's how we live unexpressed. Who mocks at us? Our own I mocks us. The I says, I expected you to perform. Legs, I expected you to perform. Intellect, why didn't you perform? You owe it to me to perform. You know what I'm suffering. I'm the ego. I'm always suffering. I'm always burning. I wanted you to give me something through which I can be healed. And you didn't do that. You failed me. You disappointed me. And all your life, you lived under the burden of that guilt. Oh, I couldn't do enough to assuage the wounded self. Oh, I couldn't do enough to heal my inner wounds. Mind you, you would never be able to do enough. The more you do, the more your wounds are deepened because the wounds are false. You perpetuate the wounds by treating them as real. When you don't have a sickness and still the doctor prescribes something to you, then he is helping you remain sick. Because now, the idea that you are sick would become deeper and validated by an authority. You get it? To live without burdening yourself with the result of action is to live freely. That is the fulfillment of life. That is the blossoming of your entire self. Only then can you say that you have really lived. Because if you are not expressed, how are you alive? The ego says the purpose of life is to get fulfillment. But your entire system and existence says the purpose of life is just expression, not fulfillment. Fulfilled you already are. Now express your fulfillment. Joyful you already are. Now express your joy. On the other hand, if you convince yourself that you are not yet joyful, then you won't take the liberty to express yourself. You will say, first things first. First of all, I have to obtain joy. Only after I obtain joy will I move into expressing joy. What do I express? I still don't have joy. And if you don't have joy, you can never, never, never get it. Expression is something that can happen right now. Achievement is something that can never, never happen. It has been drilled down deeply in our minds. That we live in order to achieve. That we live in order to become. We do not live in order to become. We live so that we may just express, manifest, talk, sing, walk, read, write. Let the entire system dance. Dance for no reason, for no purpose, for no end. Not to obtain anything, but just to say thank you. Well, everything is so beautiful, I must dance. I am not dancing so that you may pay me something. 
I'm dancing because I already feel very well paid. And these are two different things, right? The ego says, dance. Maybe the dance would fetch you something. Existence says, dance. Because you already have everything. Do you see what yoga is? Yoga is to dance without a reason. Yoga does not mean following particular patterns. Yoga means to move about patternlessly. And to not to bother if you come across a pattern. Well, it's a part of patternlessness to sometimes follow patterns. If I refuse consistently to follow patterns, even that refusal becomes a pattern. <coughs> so sometimes I will be alright following patterns, at other times I will follow no pattern. Now you decide whether that is living by pattern or patternlessness. Hmm? Moving ahead, Krishna says, only such a one is the true doer of all actions. Now, that perplexes us. Because on one hand he is saying that you are a yogi when you hardly have anything to do with your actions. You let your actions be. And now Krishna is saying when you leave your actions free, then you are the true actor. Then you are the true doer. What does he mean? Surely if he's talking about true doing, he also has false doing in his mind. We would rather go into what is false doing. What is this false actorhood. We take ourselves as the actor. But are we really actors? Do our actions originate from us? Do our likes, dislikes, thoughts really originate from an internal point? And when I say internal, I mean that the world is external. And the world includes the body, past knowledge, experiences, everything. Anything that is a part of the world is the world. So your body too is the world. Are we really the authors of our actions? No, we are not. We live mostly in a second-handed way. We wear what we have been told to wear. We eat what is the tradition to eat. We speak a language that society has given us. Worse still, we think thoughts that society has given us. We live in a way that is sanctioned by religion, custom, time, age, our economic status and the rest of it. We are not really the doers. The doer is the advertisement on the TV screen that makes us do something. The doer is all the elements of our education that have shaped our consciousness. So the doer is always somebody else. We unnecessarily keep feeling that we are doing something. One feels attracted to food, one says, I am going to the food. If you would ask Krishna, he would say, wait, there is a little mistake here. You are not going to the food. You are being compelled to go to the food by your biology. You are not going there. Do you have an option to go or not? You don't have an option. Just as your heart does not have an option to beat. Or not. You get attracted to a man or woman, Krishna would not say that this is your sovereign decision. He would say, oh well, again the same old story. I know where it comes from. It comes from your biology. It's very, very predictable. 
in fact looking at your physical and mental constitution even the approximate form of the man or woman you would be attracted to can be predicted it is so very mechanical you are not the doer of your action situations are determining your life the funny thing is you are existing thinking that you would somehow change or manipulate the situations do you get a link here when you live with respect to situations then situations get a strangle hold over you when the purpose of your existence is to do something with the situations then you do not even know that you have allowed the situations complete control over yourself in your own wisdom you are glad that you are fighting the situations you are not fighting the situations you have now located yourself with respect to the situations and that's a defeat that's a defeat right in the beginning you are saying the purpose of my life is to change the situations so now your life is definitely linked to situations the situations have won even before the war has begun now the situations will keep determining you keep determining you this determination of the self by situations is called conditioning this is called conditioning and when you are conditioned you unnecessarily burden yourself with actorhood you are not the actor anymore the world is acting through you all the external forces are acting through you your mother is acting through you it's another matter that the mother's mother is acting through her the priest is acting through you the tv stars the movie stars are acting through you the big politicians are acting through you your role models are acting through you the myths and the gods are acting through you you are living somebody else's life and it is not even one person's life you are living the life of every single person that you ever came across or did not come across the world has come together to define you rather undefine the real you you are no more the true actor you are the true actor only when you are not the actor at all which means the world has its influence on that which the world can influence you remain secluded you remain in your own groove you remain nicely ensconced in your own little chubby hole nobody can pull you out of it the upanishads call the heart as the little cave of the atman hmm the image is that of a yogi ceaselessly meditating ceaselessly meditating in a tranquil dark cave where he just cannot be ever disturbed you are constantly meditating in your heart the world cannot disturb you the world does what it can do to the world so the world does something to your hands the world does something to your body the world does something to your eyes the world does something to your stomach the world can do something even to your life but even if the world does something to your life let's say it takes away your life it still does not do anything to you you are in your own little dark cave ceaselessly meditating tranquil silent absent now you are the true doer because you are not at all the doer you are doing your own thing and your own thing is to not to do hence you are the true doer now when the non doer starts doing then he becomes a false doer you are a non doer when you take over action upon yourself then you become a false doer 
you are the non achiever when you take upon yourself the obligation to achieve then you become a false achiever you have to do nothing you have not been born with the responsibility to reach anywhere or go anywhere you are born at the highest point you are born at the destination you will die at the destination so what has changed with birth and death born at destination gone at destination always at destination before birth during life after life hardly anything has changed when you do your true thing then you are the true doer and your true thing is to relax in non doing you are really doing in relaxing you are doing what you must and when you relax then the body is let loose to fly and when you try to fly then the body is tied down with a thousand chains now it cannot fly you relax your life will fly you try to fly your life will collapse yes so this sounds for me as like i have this um sounds like i possessed my body and i'm suffering because of that and if you that you you to just like let it go like just let the body go for once and for all and just see just just don't interact don't do anything don't be the body you are again committing the same mistake like don't be the body and don't not be the body be what you are stop talking about the body why are you meddling in the body's affairs again you are doing the same thing i am not the birthday boy hmm do you do you trespass into somebody's wedding in the church and go there and hold the woman shake her up and say i'm not your husband <laughs> but i don't even know how to explain there's no like there is no words there is no need to there explain no there is no way need to explain. explain there is no need to explain you were not born with the obligation to explain to any teacher yeah but maybe i need to express Ah, that's not the same as explaining. Yeah, express. Yeah, express. express yes. My, yes. My you can express by being random. Yeah. You can express by just throwing about your limbs, and that's all right. I'll know. You don't need to express by looking wise. You don't need to express in a coherent way. You can appear totally foolish, and you have expressed. So give yourself the freedom to be foolish, and you have expressed. when you try to explain then you unnecessarily try to act wise you just want to express right yeah 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 i just want to say what i have yes yeah, so, yeah. so just say aloud ooh you have expressed ooh excellent excellent that doesn't quite explain to those who are fond of explanations but those who know how to listen would have heard what you said Maybe I don't even know what I you said. You don't need to because you yourself are a foreigner, an outsider to yourself. What you are is not what you perceive yourself as. Don't take yourself as the meditator within. That which you think you are is a foreigner, is an alien. Your consciousness is not what you are, so you don't need to actively know. Your knowledge is far, far deeper than what you consciously know. 
So even if you feel that you don't consciously have knowledge, you still know. Because in meditation, everything is already known. You don't need to assure and secure yourself by way of conscious knowledge. You don't need to. What makes you a little upset, what makes you a little nervous is the fact that you cannot put it together in a nice worldly form. You don't need to. The ego is saying, I must know. And you know why the ego must know? Because knowledge adds to the self-worth of the ego. The ego says, I have moved up a notch because now I know. There is no need to know. There is no need to know. There is not even the obligation to understand. There is no obligation. And I mean, I'm like, I'm doing this, but at the same time, I'm doing that. You don't have an obligation to be the watcher. You don't have an obligation to witness. You don't have an obligation to be enlightened. You don't have an obligation to understand. You don't have any obligation. All obligations turn you into somebody else. Never take up an obligation upon yourself. Never. Even when you are accepting responsibilities and obligations, you must remain insulated from them. Never take it up upon yourself. With all the responsibilities of the world, remain free of responsibilities. 